Hello, everyone. I'm Loanne Lake, Communications Director for Leading on Opportunity. Welcome to Shaping Opportunity, Conversations with the Leading on Opportunity Council. We have created this interview series for you to hear from our council members about their work to address the economic impacts of COVID-19. Additionally, we will look at how our cross-cutting factors, the impact of segregation and social capital, affect economic mobility here in Charlotte, Mecklenburg. Today, I will be interviewing council member Brian Collier, executive vice president at Foundation for the Carolinas and co-author of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Opportunity Task Force Report. We'll speak about the types of initiatives being funded through the COVID-19 Relief Fund. Let's tune in. Thank you for joining us for this council conversation. Uh, we're really excited to share with the community the work that our council members have been doing for the past year and just sharing what's being done to help mitigate COVID-19 impacts in our community. And so um, I know you've been very busy attending to the needs of not just individuals, but our organizations that are were seeking funding uh, during the pandemic. So why don't you share with our viewers some of the initiatives you've been involved with through the foundation? It's been uh, probably like everybody else. I don't think I've ever had a busier time in my life. I, I tell everyone that if I could go back into like March 1st, and if you doubled my workload, I'd gladly take that over, you know, what happened in the community starting in mid-March all the way through, we're in the middle of June now. So it's just been incredibly, incredibly busy. And the things I've been focused on are, uh, you know, it, before March, we were focused on trying to figure out how to move the opportunity agenda forward primarily through our grant making activities and obviously the work on leading an opportunity. And then starting in mid-March, we, uh, thanks to the community's generosity, were able to start the COVID response fund mm -hmm. in partnership with the United Way. So to date, we've already raised just shy of $20 million and we've given out $10.2 million to nonprofits across Mecklenburg County who are working on issues where they are trying to get resources and financial assistance and shelter and all of these very necessary things to individuals who have been impacted through the COVID virus uh, in our community. And at this point, there are very few people who haven't been impacted to some degree. I mean, the mere fact that you and I are on a Zoom call is right. uh, evidence that everybody's been impacted, but certainly many in our community have been impacted much more uh, than others. And, and that's, it's wonderful to hear that that level of commitment from funders has gone into making uh, money available to help the community. So what would be the areas where you've seen the biggest requests for funding, if that's something you can share? Sure. And it's interesting because um, it evolves over time. So when you, we first started out in the first few days after the COVID virus sort of became a national issue and certainly here in Mecklenburg County, uh, it was mostly around shelter, fin emergency financial assistance and food. Those mm -hmm. were the three primary things where we were giving away most of the money and supporting organizations at the grassroots level and institutional level. As things have evolved, and this has gone on longer than we expected probably, um, now we're, what we're looking at, and this is really relevant to the opportunity work, is now we're looking at since kids have been out of school for so long and we're approaching a summer, what are those kids going to do in, with their unstructured time over the summer? So right. how can we help ch with childcare? How can we help with summer camps and other types of virtual learning environments? How can we make sure that there isn't summer learning loss as they get ready to go back to school? Uh, so that's one of the big things. The other thing that we're looking at, as I mentioned, is child care. How can yeah. we help parents return to work um, and ensure that children have a safe place to be uh, while they're at work? And uh, the other thing that we're looking at, which I don't even know if we know what the ramifications yet are of this, but we're looking at mental health issues that have um, were already prevalent in our community. Uh, if you think about teenage anxiety, young children dealing with a lot of stress, uh, trauma, things like that. Just multiply that now that we've had uh, sheltering in place, mm -hmm. social isolation, just the trauma of the economy and all of the things that have occurred to people in our community. So those are kind of the, the three buckets of, of things that we're really looking at, in addition to all of the other things that are going on with food, with shelter, um, all of those things. 
So how does an organization, um, what are the things that you are most looking for with someone that may be applying for assistance to help members of the community? What would, what would be the, go ahead. Sure, I, I, I tell everyone that the theme of our fund is, is how do we use the, the expertise and the scale of nonprofit organizations, again, big or small, sometimes the smallest organizations are the more nimble ones. So it's not, we're not excluding small organizations, but how do we use the skill, expertise and scale of nonprofit organizations to get emergency resources out to individuals who are in dire need in our community? So what I'm looking at is, uh, what's the scale at which you're gonna um, try to solve the problem? How are you trying to solve the problem and hopefully in an innovative way? Um, and then who are the people who are impacted? And we're really trying to get the money to those who have been impacted most in our community, which okay. tend to be those who are either um, in elderly population or fragile communities, things like that are primarily where we're trying to get the majority of the resources. But again, people across uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg have been impacted. Okay. So we're not ruling out anybody, but the, the primarily we're trying to get those to marginalized communities and those who have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID virus. Okay, thank you. And so we know that COVID has shown a light on the numerous barriers to care and resources and services that communities of color often face. Reshaping those systems is uh, part of an, an integral part of the work of leading an opportunity. So can you describe how the current barriers due to COVID are impacting economic mobility based on what you've seen so far? Well, um, unfortunately, if I look across all of the determinants of, of our leading an opportunity report, you know, early childhood, uh, family and child stability, and college and career readiness, and you look across at segregation and social capital, which we identified mm -hmm. as cross-cutting factors, there isn't one area of that that is safe from harm right now with regard to the virus. Uh, especially if I look at, I mean, think of the damage that is being done for our children where their structure of school, that structured environment is not in place and probably won't be in place like we knew it before the virus for quite a while. Right. But if you think about that piece where children left school on March, I think it's 13th, won't return until the middle of August, that piece is huge. I mean, not just from the education um, aspects, but the social capital expert, um, to the extent which social capital is impacted, um, food, all of the things that you get when you're in a structured environment um, are at risk right now. And you know, I contrast that with the recession in 2009, 10. Mm -hmm. Back then, really what we were dealing with was mostly an economic challenge to our country. Right. And people lost their jobs, which was serious. But now what you have is you have economic impact, plus you have the breakdown of things like health care and education. So it's an unprecedented time for our community. And I hope that I, I really hope that we step up and respond in a big way. Right. And as you mentioned, coupled with mental stresses that affect both the parents and the children, we'll, we'll really all have to pitch in to make sure that we are looking out for our neighbors as we go forward. Um, you have given us a lot to think about, and we can't cover everything in this conversation, but as we conclude, are there any final thoughts that you would like to leave with our viewers about the work of the Foundation for the Carolinas or the COVID Relief Fund, and let people know where they can find more information on how to apply for those resources? Sure. Um, I, I guess what I would love to leave people with is um, I'm committed, and as everyone at the Foundation for the Carolinas and our partner, partners at the United Way, I, I can tell you without a doubt that we are living and breathing this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There is no weekday, weekend, uh, evening time off, things like that anymore, because we're just trying to find out how do we get the most amount of resources out to organizations that are helping people throughout our community. And I would tell everyone that, you know, if you read the task force report in detail, like you have and like I have, you, you see these subtle things that are coming to life right now. We, one of which is, one of the things that we tried to talk to people about when we did the task force report is that, although you're gonna think about this as a report on poverty, it's not that. It's a report about how we treat one another, how we would want to be treated, how we 
how do we show kindness and respect and love to all of our neighbors? Because there are times like this where we are, it truly demonstrates that we are all somewhat in this together, although we do see disparate impacts that have to be addressed. We said in the report that this is a report, that this is a, a plan for how our community moves forward in the way that we treat one another and how we do that going forward. And my hope is that when this is all said and done, that we will take a, a good close look at ourselves and, and think about how we might change systems in the future so that things like people being homeless or out of money or vulnerable health care or schools be, uh, school systems being fragile, that we might be able to take a look at how we avoid that in the future. Because our community uh, has too far to go. We don't need to keep having these setbacks. We need to be moving forward. Correct. So if you want more detail about the foundation, we're at fftc.org. And um, you can certainly look at the United Ways website as well for information about the COVID fund. Well, thank you, Brian. We appreciate your insight. We do invite our viewers to share their thoughts in the comments section of this broadcast or submit questions to info at leadingonopportunity.org. You may also download the Leading on Opportunity report that Brian referenced from our website, leadingonopportunity.org. So thank you again, and you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Luann. Bye-bye.